afternoon, everyone, or, or evening, or even for some of you in the world, good morning. And thank you for attending my, my presentation. You've probably heard a lot already today about, and yesterday, about IoT devices, IoT device management, um, security, how do you integrate blockchain, um, integration of machine learning, you know, a whole bunch of different areas of IoT. In this presentation, I'm gonna focus on IoT data and IoT data management and how do you handle the large amounts of IoT data. So I'll now switch to the presentation and you'll see me again when we get to the questions. So uh, to start with, IoT is not a, a silo. It's, it's not something that should be treated separately to everything else. IoT is a part of enterprise data assets. So it needs to be treated as part of a connected ecosystem. And so the IoT data is part of your data assets as an enterprise. It, it goes with your enterprise data assets, anything you may have in the cloud. And you get best value out of IoT data when it can be integrated with, correlated with, joined with the other data assets that you have. And this is crucial to the digital transformation. If you want to start doing things like predictive maintenance or part management, you start thinking about uh, cybersecurity or predictive monitoring and automated customer engagement and all of these different things, you need to integrate things that you're getting from IoT with data that you may have elsewhere in the enterprise. And this is true across every industry. Uh, there are innovations happening across so many different industries with, uh, with IoT. And it's gonna affect everyone at some point. And getting the best value out of IoT really involves dealing with the IoT data. And the challenge today is that you know, there are so many different technologies. You have data that's being generated through websites, applications, even like network traffic, uh, devices you may have in the enterprise. And then you have the, the new wave of IoT devices that are uh, mobile, uh, uh, deliver to cloud automatically. Um, they can be very varied and the data content can be very varied. And so there's so many different technologies you may have already, um, some legacy data, uh, databases, uh, you may have a, a data lake, you have messaging systems, ETL and batch systems. And all of these need to work together in order to fulfill business needs, to best serve customers to deal with orders and inventory and security and real-time reporting. Um, so all of these things need to work together in order to provide seamlessly the best value out of IoT data. The other thing is data volumes. You think about IoT and there was this study that came out from IDC a few months ago and they basically stated that today we're generating around 16 zettabytes of data annually. So every year, another 16 zettabytes of data. By 2025, they're estimating that will lead to 160 zettabytes of new data generated every year. And anyone with a math background will recognize that curve. It's an exponential curve. And that means that in every two years, we're generating more data than has ever been generated in the whole history of mankind before. And that's a lot of data. Now of that data, today around 5% of it is generated and needs to be dealt with in real time, immediately. By 2025, they're estimating that 25% of all data generated will be real time in nature. So it'll be generated and have to be dealt with in real time. And of that, 95% of it will be generated by IoT. Now this is the, the kicker, that uh, you have all of this data being generated, but that thin yellow line is the available storage. So only a small percentage of all the data being generated can ever be stored. There's literally physically not enough hard drives, flash drives, magnetic tape, newfangled crystal structures to store all of the data that's being generated. It's, it's just something that you cannot do. So if you can't store all of the data, in fact, if you can only store a small fraction of it, you're left with the conclusion that you have to process and analyze the data 
in memory before it ever hits disk, before it ever hits storage in a streaming fashion. And this kind of streaming approach to things kind of helps you move to a, a digital transformation where you can integrate and join data in real time and you can do real time alerting and monitoring. And you can also use this for integration. So you can um, combine data together and land it somewhere, whether it's in the cloud or a file system or databases, et cetera. But really it's to try and move to a unified technology that incorporates IoT data with the rest of your enterprise data uh, in a scalable fashion um, using a inherently streaming in-memory architecture. And it's not just uh, IoT data that is enormous. Um, people don't normally think of things like uh, security data as IoT, but security data can be enormous. If you think about um, network devices, routers, right, you can have a NetFlow data, which generates a lot of data, but if you're doing package cap packet capture on the network, that's immense amounts of data. And so you think about not just IoT, but other sources of data, and that's, you can see where these data volumes are coming from. Um, you have to think about how do you incorporate all of this together and answer important questions. You know, how do you avoid losing or ignoring valuable data while still only storing the minimum? And that kind of gets to the notion of the difference between data and information. Anyone with an information science background will know there's a difference, you know, that the large amounts of data can have very small information content. If you think about measuring the temperature in a room and you're doing that once a second, that's over three and a half thousand data points um, in an hour. But if the temperature stayed the same, 70 degrees for that whole hour, how much information is that? That's just one piece of information. It was 70 degrees for the whole hour. So you know, other than kind of keep alive information from individual devices, from a storage perspective, if you want to do uh, machine learning or if you want to do uh, further analytics or reporting, you don't need those thousand data points. You just need to know that between this time period, the temperature was 70 degrees. And so you can start to think about how do you convert the information content, the data content to information. Um, and that's really what we mean by only store the minimum, you're storing the information. And how do you also, at the same time, correlate events so that you can do immediate responses, so that you can react instantly, right? So if, with that temperature scenario, if the temperature suddenly, over a period of you know, less than a minute, increased to, you know, 200 degrees, uh, there's a good chance the room's on fire. Right? So you can react immediately to that. As soon as you see that temperature starting to rise rapidly, you need to be able to react immediately to it. And there are obviously much more critical situations um, that you have to respond to even faster. You know, you're measuring the speed of a turbine. If it suddenly drops, uh, you need to be able to react in milliseconds. You know, so those are the, the things we're talking about here. How do you work on the data so you only store the minimum while at the same time being able to react immediately um, and give proactive responses when you actually need to. And doing this to uh, obviously to, for operational efficiency, but then also to better serve customers and protect your reputation um, and be competitors because innovation is re really what drives the competitive nature of, uh, of our society. And if you, can out innovate people or you can come up with new ways of doing things, you can disrupt and you can change things. And uh, that's the way that competition works. And it's not just you know, IoT data that is streaming. And the reason I mention this is because if you're getting device data as data streams, we already talked about that, that you need to be able to get the data in a streaming fashion because you can't store all of it. But if you're getting that data as data streams, then in order to make best use of it, in order to correlate it with other stuff and make instant decisions based on correlations between IoT data and what's going on in the enterprise and databases and what's going on in the machine that's written to logs, all of that needs to be streaming as well. And it's just uh, a historical thing that we deal with all of that rest of that data in batches. Now, if you think about why 
we have batch processing of, of data. Um, it's really because historically, storage was cheaper than CPU and memory. And in fact, having enough memory to do like a daily batch job was just out of the question. But you could store that data and process it from disk and write back to disk. You know, so the notion of, of batches is really a, an artifact of previous technology limitations. But if you have sufficient CPU and memory, and both CPU and memory are getting much, much cheaper, then you can start to think about, instead of uh, doing queries against the database, uh, do change data capture and turn that into a data stream. Um, instead of processing machine logs a log at a time, you read at the end of the log file and stream that out in real time. So that gives you the notion of all of your data in the enterprise, not just IoT data, being streaming, uh, which then means that stream processing is a major infrastructure requirement. And by stream processing, I mean the in-memory uh, processing and uh, analytics of data before it ever hits disk um, in a, a structured way in order to uh, create some business outcome. And this is part of uh, overall data modernization. And we're seeing that you know, across a lot of our customers, and it's definitely evident across the, kind of the whole industry, um, that there's this notion that you know, there's a lot of value in older data and older data stores, legacy data stores. And legacy can mean you know, three years old these days. But there's a lot of value in that data. And you can't just rip out everything old and replace it with something new. For example, if you're a manufacturing plant, um, manufacturing equipment doesn't work on internet times. It's not like a iPhone where some people replace it every year. Um, it's something that maybe has a 10, 20 year lifespan. And you can't just rip all of that out and replace it with something new because it sounds like a good idea or because it's trendy. It has to be done in a methodical way. And typically, as these things age out. You know, so um, how do you access that data and work with that as part of your IoT assets and incorporate that with some of the newer data you have? You know, so you can have an older manufacturing plant that has robots and things in it. Um, and maybe that data is being written to a historian, which is you know, a database. And now you can stream that data out by doing change data capture on that database. And then you have um, a live data from that. And maybe you want to augment that by slapping on new sensors onto the motors on the robot that will measure uh, vibration and temperature and movement and all of these things and correlate the old data with the new data in order to make sure the robot's behaving properly. So uh, when you think about data modernization, it's not about replacing old castles with shiny new skyscrapers. It's about how do you incorporate the new technologies with the old technologies. And some of the things we hear from our customers are you know, the things that they have today, the legacy systems, they either can't keep up or they expect that in the future, the data volumes are going to massively increase. And they need to be able to be prepared for that and need to be able to deal with that or the latency in the applications is too high. Maybe they're writing everything to a database and they're doing batch processing on that afterwards, which is going to give them you know, maybe two, three hour timeframes before they know something. And they want to move to more you know, five, 10 second timeframes before they know something. And then in addition to that, there's a lot of pressure on the people within organizations that do analytics to produce new applications and to produce new ways of viewing things. And a lot of this comes down to our exposure as consumers to things like smartphones. Now, we are used to now having information at our fingertips, being able to receive instant messages and instant video and instant news. Everything is just there. And the interfaces, the ways that we access these things is also but they're very easy. We have very easy access to real-time information. And as consumers, we're used to that. When you move to an enterprise scenario and you want the same out of your business systems or your manufacturing systems or whatever, um, it, it's much harder to get to because things maybe weren't architected that way. Um, and when you're asked to produce new 
outputs, new applications, new views, new reports on that. You need to be nimble as a as an analyst, an analytics department, a data science department to be able to keep up with all the demands that you're getting. So we need to think about architectures that can handle all of those things without necessarily ripping and replacing all of the existing systems. And if you think about um, manufacturing, for example, you know, there was a, a very hierarchical view of kind of how manufacturing looked, um, all the way from the individual sensors and devices uh, going through kind of control levels and then manufacturing execution systems all the way through to kind of ERP, which basically managed the supply chain. And that kind of hierarchical, very rigid architecture with specific things at different places um, and processing done in particular areas is being replaced with this more general architecture that has you know, devices on one end and applications on the other end with processing and analytics and storage happening wherever it makes sense. Um, and this may be term the fog. Um, you may call some pieces on here first receivers. Um, it's really what, uh, you know, how you want to term it, but at the end of the day, it's an architecture that incorporates the processing analytics and storage and movement of data in a very flexible way that enables lots of different types of applications to be produced that can both minimize your uh, amount of data that you need to store um, so you can manage huge amounts of data, but can also react immediately. And that kind of smart data architecture um, can be very varied. And I'm going to give you some different flavors of uh, ways of piecing together this architecture that can solve different scenarios, right? So you have um, to think about kind of the requirements here. We need to be able to collect and process data, uh, perform analytics, be able to take actions on the data and on the results of analytics, things we find out, visualize results, and do this kind of at the edge, kind of in the cloud, on premise, and you know, wherever it makes sense for a particular application. Let's start with the simplest kind of IoT architecture. And this is what a lot of people kind of think about as IoT. And you have devices and they send data to the cloud. And uh, that's where you do your processing and analytics. And yet yeah, there's you know, a lot of examples of that, but there are also a lot of issues with that kind of architecture. Um, you know, for, for a start, not every device you're interested in is I. It doesn't speak I. It, it, it doesn't know internet, right? There's a lot of legacy devices out there that um, you want to be able to connect into this type of architecture, but you know, how do you manage that? How do you turn them into kind of internet-enabled things? And the other thing is maybe you need to react fast. You're not going to be able to react fast if all of your processing is in the cloud. You know, so two of our things we're trying to solve here aren't solved by this architecture. Um, we can solve the, the things thing, and there's a lot of um, discussions and momentum around protocol translation gateways. Uh, protocol translation gateway um, is like C-3PO from Star Wars. It knows how to talk to you know, both modern robots like R2-D2 and also the uh, dehumidifiers that were working in the in the desert to pull water out of the air. So it, you need to be able to talk to your manufacturing equipment, um, old school things that are wired into boxes that talk BACnet and Modbus and Zigbee and some of those other protocols, and integrate that with the new devices that talk MQTT or AMQP over TCP. Right. So. The protocol translation gateways, they, they work with that. Microsoft has one with the IoT Edge. Uh, there's work going on uh, within a consortium organized by Dell, the EdgeX Foundry, whose goal is to produce a modular protocol translation gateway. But it's not enough, though, just to do the protocol translation at the Edge. Because if you're just doing that and you're sending everything up into the cloud, you're still missing out on things. You're not doing your analytics quickly and be able to respond rapidly. Um, 
you don't have this flexible architecture and you're sending huge amounts of data over a network into the cloud that you maybe don't even need to. So that's where you start to have to think about uh, doing edge processing and analytics um, also within the gateway. And so you can start to do things like uh, change detection. But instead of sending all the data into the cloud, you only send the data into the cloud when it changes with you know, pings, uh, heartbeats, to let you know the device is still alive. You know, so instead of sending the three and a half thousand data points a second from your uh, thermostat or your um, thousand data points a, a second from your uh, turbine, you just send it when it changes and, and a heartbeat to say that I'm still alive. Right? So you, you can do that kind of thing at the edge. And you can also do analytics. You can look for unusual patterns or anomalies. Um, and then alert on that and maybe uh, respond and change and modify devices, uh, stop things from happening, uh, sound alarms, that kind of thing, and do that at the edge as well. So you can get this really fast response. And that uh, type of thing often in involves machine learning. So you know, a model that you can use here is you take not the data, but the information content from the results of the processing and analytics you move that into the cloud, you do that across uh, a large number of, of areas, and now the cloud is accumulating information, not the raw data, but information, which can be used to perform machine learning. And once you perform the machine learning, and you've built a model, and you've tested that model, and it looks like it's valid, you can then move that model to the edge. Once the model's at the edge, it can be used to make predictions in real time close to where the data is being generated. It can also be used for anomaly detection to look for unusual behavior, and a whole bunch of other things that you can imagine machine learning could be useful. So this is kind of a general reference architecture of how you would incorporate machine learning into IoT. And obviously that can then uh, be scaled up. You can add in multiple additional uh, nodes within a particular site. You can add additional sites. You can accumulate all of that information in the cloud, perform the machine learning, export the models, and do your edge analytics. So now you've done a lot of the things we talked about. You've reduced the amount of data down because you're sending only information to the cloud. And you're also able to do processing and analytics at the edge, which enables you to respond rapidly to issues, um, send alerts, maybe send those alerts into the cloud as well so you can have a visual view over uh, everything that's happening across all of your all of your sites. So this this kind of architecture works really well for a, a lot of different use cases where you have uh, information in a lot of different sites that you need to be able to view in a single place. Uh, but in a number of different scenarios, you can imagine that you want to also add in on-site processing and analytics. Um, and this could be for a number of reasons. It could be because you need to be able to manage an individual facility or an individual production line and do that separately from a lot of other things. And it requires not just very specialized um, algorithms and specialized views into things, but you also um, need to be able to react more quickly than if the data had to make it all the way into the cloud. Um, and you may want to repeat that across a number of sites. They all have their own autonomy. But then you also have situations like, imagine this isn't manufacturing, imagine it's healthcare. You know, in a healthcare scenario, you may not be allowed to send a lot of this data into the cloud in, a, uh, it, it, in the form that it is on-premise. Uh, you may have patient data in there that is protected by HIPAA and other regulations, and that may not be permissible to send that into a cloud. But what you may be able to do is to anonymize that data. And so if within a hospital, you can view everything that's happening um, based on the, the architecture with kind of localized processing and analytics for an individual hospital. But data that's sent up into the cloud is anonymized, the identifying patient information is removed, then you can additionally do machine learning in the cloud. You can also view across a whole bunch of different hospitals, you know, status of things and uh, where you are with things like inventory and other stuff. Um, but what you can do 
uh, with a machine learning is maybe you can look at trends um, and look for correlations between information about patients uh, in an anonymized fashion. Maybe looking for combinations of different measurements on that patient um, and what their symptoms are and look for relationships between those that you may not have spotted before and then apply that machine learning close to the patient. And so you can start to think of a, a healthcare scenario using anonymized data being produced by huge amounts of hospitals that will help you save patients' lives because you can now um, look for things and learn things about patients that you wouldn't have been able to do before. So if you have an architecture like this, it's enabling you to connect anything because you have the internet-enabled IoT, which you can already talk to, you already do MQTT, AMQP, TCP, HTTP, whatever protocol it's using. But you also have the protocol translation gateway that has modules that allow you to speak to BACnet and Modbus and OPC UA and all these other things um, that talk to more and more devices. It allows you to react immediately because you're doing the edge processing and analytics and also limit the data sent to the cloud and change that data to information before it ever makes it into the cloud to make everything much more efficient. It obviously will scale as required because you are uh, moving a lot of the processing to kind of edge devices and edge devices can inherently scale just by adding more of them and add more on-site processing and analytics as necessary and then scale out the cloud because that's what the cloud is designed to do. With the ability to control everything centrally through a, a cloud interface. Um, so not just be able to visualize everything but be able to work with everything centrally through a correct cloud interface. Now, IoT, as I mentioned, is not a separate thing. So to get the full picture, now you have to join together not just the IoT data, but you have to also bring in other enterprise data. So you start looking at things like um, finance information, customer information, uh, supply chain, inventory, all of those things. And the biggest value that you're going to get from IoT is when you can join that data with your IoT data. You know, so an example would be if you have a, a sensor on uh, a motor and that sensor is just sending out data, say, over MQTT, and the data it's sending is device ID XYZ value 3. That doesn't mean much from an analytics perspective. You know it's a sensor, you know it's sending out value three, you're not quite sure what that means or what that sensor is, where it is. But if you can join that sensor information with information that you have in your asset database, with information you have in your ERP system, then you'll find that this is a sensor and it's measuring vibration levels on a motor that was bought three years ago with a warranty of three years and with an average lifespan that you've seen uh, in your dealings with this type of motor um, of you know, 3.2 years. And that's gonna start to give you much more information for, for your analytics. Now that information wasn't present in the IoT side of the world, but it's present in the other enterprise assets that you have. That's just a very simple example, but I'm sure you can think of hundreds of more examples where by augmenting IoT data with other data, it just makes it so much more valuable. I mentioned machine learning. Uh, the way that you really integrate machine learning is that you need to be able to work with uh, data, first of all. So uh, a lot of the machine learning algorithms, they're kind of sensitive and picky to the format of the data that you give it to train it. They tend to work best when you can present all variables together in a single row um, and so that you can uh, train the model based on the correlations and relationships between variables. Um, there, there are algorithms that work with time series data and receiving events over time um, that are you know, more complex. But uh, you know, a key thing within machine learning is you need to process and prepare data and get it ready for the learning first. 
And what you want to try and do is make sure the same data that you're using to prepare machine learning and train a model can in future be used to perform real-time scoring, um, inference, predictions, anomaly detection, classification, or whatever it is you're doing, can, can be done on the same data. Right? So if you, you know, take a look at this flow, you take the data wherever it's coming from, you know, IoT and maybe some enterprise data, uh, join that together, prepare it, get it into the right format, write that out to files, and then have data scientists run their magic against the, the files and build a machine learning model. And obviously test that, validate it against the data, ensure that it's correct, export that model, and then utilize that within a, uh, a streaming architecture. You know, so now the same data that is being accumulated for training can be passed into the in-memory streaming part and compared against the model, push through the model and see what the model tells you about it. And so that would enable you then to immediately uh, on real-time data, see if an anomaly was occurring or on real-time data, predict when something was going to fail or classify something in some way based on the data you're getting. Maybe it's image classification. Right? So all these things can be done if you have this kind of architecture that enables you to train the machine learning model and to do real-time scoring. And of course, if you're seeing that the model isn't working well, because you're continually accumulating training files, you can then also um, retrain the model and re-export it and resend it back into the streaming side and now work with a new updated model. So that it makes that whole process much easier. The other thing that I mentioned, and this is something that we see uh, customers doing, is you know, if you have on-premise uh, manufacturing equipment or other equipment that is not IoT, it's, it's just T, <laughs> you know, it's, they're, they're things, uh, but they're not uh, already hooked up into the internet. Um, maybe they're writing their data into a historian database. Then by utilizing change data capture and doing that within the framework of this architecture that I've just talked about, you can treat historian data as if it was real-time IoT data being sent to you in any other way. You know, so it's a way of modernizing your existing investments um, in manufacturing or in other equipment that writes to a database, medical information that writes to a database, for example, uh, by using change data capture and streaming out what's being written to the database in real time, you now have a stream of your IoT data as well. So just talk about some use cases of these architectures. Um, one obvious one is actually cybersecurity. Now, um, a lot of new approaches to kind of cybersecurity do incorporate uh, machine learning. You know, so it's about looking at what is normal behavior and classifying that as normal behavior and then being able to spot unusual behavior really quickly. And the best way of doing that uh, is by collecting and correlating as much data as you can. Um, it's easier to fake a single piece of data than it is to fake a whole collection of data from a lot of different sources. Um, if you think about uh, Stuxnet, you know, Stuxnet was a virus that um, infected the control systems of centrifuges um, that were making nuclear material. And it did two things to these centrifuges in a simplistic fashion. It made them spin faster so they would dis destroy themselves. And it also told the uh, people monitoring the centrifuges that everything was okay to give them time to destroy themselves. Now, if you are also measuring a whole bunch of other information about those things, like vibration levels and power draw, maybe video imagery of, of those things, um, and correlating that with what you were being told, you will see that what you're being told isn't actually what's happening. And so by utilizing machine learning and incorporating IoT data with other data that you may have, um, maybe network data, seeing if there's been a security breach, but all these things, you get to get a much bigger picture of uh, the security around IoT. And this also works for kind of enterprise security as well. 
but in the context of IoT security, it's essential to correlate as much information as possible. Now, another example where machine learning can be very important is in uh, production quality, where you collect and analyze device data and you predict out with machine learning what you expect the quality of the end result to be uh, based on what you've seen in the past. And so um, instead of a widget making it all the way down a production line only to go in the reject box, you may spot very early on that based on what we've learned in our machine learning models, if the parameters of the widget are uh, outside a certain range at this point in the production line, then it's going to fail anyway. You know, so by incorporating machine learning and sensor data and the architecture that I mentioned with uh, edge analytics based on machine learning, you can start to get a better picture of production quality and that actually ends up with a massive ROI because you're not wasting anywhere near as much um, raw materials or uh, pieces as you're building and moving down the production line. Um, similar story with healthcare monitoring. Now, it's, it's one thing to be able to measure certain aspects and parameters of a patient, but if you can join all of that with multiple med medical devices, um, patient data, potentially utilizing machine learning on anonymized data um, to enable you to look for uh, anomalies or potential issues. Um, like if, for example, if you had additional information about a diabetes patient in addition to uh, glucose measurements, you knew when they last ate, um, whether they'd been out for a walk recently, what their heart rate was, uh, and you could combine that and correlate all this together, compare that against the model, you would be able to track immediately if this patient was at risk. Yeah, so again, by joining together lots of different patient information, running it through models, you can have immediate insights into patients and react immediately. And also, um, if you can uh, somehow get everyone to collaborate, you can get large scale data, again, anonymize, to look for trends. So spot outbreaks and things like that very quickly. And a final example, uh, again, using the similar architecture is location tracking. And location is a really important aspect of IoT and is also a really important aspect of any or reason why you need stream processing. Um, the thing about location is things move around a lot and they move around quickly, and you want to be able to deal with them quickly. And we had a example uh, where, uh, with a partner building a uh, airport monitoring system, and that involved monitoring the locations of thousands of passengers in real time and staff in real time, identifying multiple different zones and looking for when people walked in and out of zones and how long they were waiting there for. And the purpose of this was if, you know, more pe too many people were waiting in one particular area, maybe it was in uh, ticketing, uh, then you could automate sending more staff to that area to deal with them. And also if people walked out into a, uh, uh, an area they weren't supposed to go to, into a, a secure area, uh, then you could spot that immediately and send someone there as well. As, but location tracking is generally a useful thing. A lot of people are used to real time with locations. Uh, if you're driving, you're probably used to using Waze. Uh, which gives you real-time insights into accidents around you and real-time routing. Um, real-time is essential and streaming is essential when it comes to location monitoring of any kind. But it has uh, benefits in manufacturing, healthcare, retail, aviation, etc. If you think about um, a question I like to ask people is you, what have airports and hospitals got in common? And the answer is problems with wheelchairs. You know, not knowing where essential equipment like a wheelchair is all the time can delay planes and can delay uh, patient treatment in hospitals. So being able to monitor these things in real time is also uh, essential. Location tracking, I think we're going to see a lot more of this type of application as real-time analytics and processing really start to pick up steam. So just a little bit about us before I finish off the presentation and open it up for questions. Um, the Stream platform is a complete end-to-end -end platform that supports streaming integration analytics across enterprise cloud and IoT. Um, we have a flexible architecture that allows you to deploy data flows across uh, on-premise in the cloud and processing at the edge. We do 
uh, continuous data collection from uh, not just IoT devices and sensors and message queues, but also from files by reading at the end and from databases through change data capture. And then we allow you to do the stream processing in memory with real-time filtering, transformation, aggregation, and enrichment, and do all of this through a SQL-based language. It makes it easy for anyone to work with. You can also do streaming analytics, so correlation of multiple data streams, uh, complex event processing, statistical analysis, uh, integration of machine learning models, and then also build visualizations and alerts and kind of trigger external systems and deliver the results of the collection, the processing, the analytics um, to anywhere, to databases, files, big data, Kafka, cloud, et cetera. Uh, we integrate with a lot of existing enterprise software, uh, open source as well as proprietary things like databases. And we do all of this in an enterprise grade fashion that is inherently clustered, distributed, scalable, reliable, and secure. Now we are a streaming integration analytics platform that supports IoT. And we support specifically the integration of IoT data with all the rest of the data that you need to give value to that IoT data. When you're building applications for our platform, you do so with data flows. Uh, you start uh, with sources, you do processing through SQL, and you end up triggering something, writing data somewhere. And you can also build dashboards, uh, live streaming visualizations by dragging and dropping visualizations. They give you a view into um, whatever the backend processing is you're doing. So you can see how you can build up IoT applications really easily by starting off with IoT data sources, uh, MQTT, AMQP, whatever you have already. Um, we have examples actually working with uh, Arduino devices and working with uh, model factories and things like that that are kind of easy to get your hands around um, and delivering that data to MQTT, processing that data, and then building a whole dashboard and visualization around it as well as controlling the devices. We integrate with a whole bunch of stuff. This is an eye chart. You're welcome to come and look at this in the uh, download of the presentation on the video. And we really differentiate ourselves by being an end-to-end -end platform, so everything that you need to actually start getting value out of your data immediately, but easy to use. Uh, so you can build applications really quickly using our platform, and it's easy to deploy them as well without any coding necessary. Um, it is an enterprise-grade platform, so it's inherently distributed, scalable, secure, reliable. And we focus on a lot of the integration aspects, so we work with most of the data sources that you'll have. If you want to know more about us, uh, here's all the links that you need. So you know, aren't there you know, lots of IoT platforms out there already? Uh, kind of open source IoT platforms, proprietary IoT platforms um, that can get to the data? Well, yes, there are. Um, and you know, I think, as I mentioned in the presentation, and I've tried to say time and time again, uh, a lot of the existing IoT platforms focus on IoT data and focus on just being able to access, collect, maybe just deliver that IoT data to the cloud, um, or if you're lucky, being able to do some processing and analytics on that IoT data. Now, if you want to get value out of that IoT data, typically you're going to need to join that with other data as well. And a lot of that other data is locked up in other places within the enterprise, and you need specific ways of getting to it, whether it's reading from files, whether it's passing logs, whether it's accessing network information, or getting data from databases in real time. Um, you need specific tools to be able to do that. And so what we've done in our platform is to look at IoT as another source of data. And yes, to be able to do things like edge processing, but edge processing is also useful for security data. Uh, not just IoT data. That whole architecture is useful for a lot of different scenarios, um, not necessarily just with IoT data, but in any situation where you have huge volumes of data coming through. I will end it there. Thank you. Mm -hmm.